I think it has been a good growth story where for the first time in our history in the past two years, 2010 and 2011, we recorded consecutive growth of 8% or over. Never in our history have we been able to do that. So that was a very significant uh, achievement from the country's point of view. In addition to that, of course, we have been able to develop some sound macroeconomic fundamentals. If you look at the key areas that uh, form the basis of macroeconomic fundamentals, inflation, unemployment, reserves, then you can look at the uh, uh, infrastructure development, poverty. In all those areas, we have shown significant improvement. So that shows that there has been a growth momentum which has been taking place. Uh, of course, it has been underpinned by the peace dividend that we are now realizing. All those have given us the confidence that we are now on a very clear upward path. Our per capita income also increased to $2,830 last year. Well on our way to the $4,000 mark that we had originally projected to be able to achieve by the year 2015. And with that, uh, our GDP of the country has risen to about $59 billion. And when you consider that it was less than $24 billion just about six years ago, that's a substantial improvement as far as our total uh, expansion of our economy is concerned. So, uh, that will give you a, you know, a snapshot that we are on a path of growth which we need to sustain of course now. We have clear indications or we have clear targets for the next five years. I think in the first time in our history once again that we have economic targets set out in our overall planning stages. In the next Five years, we will go well beyond the $4,000 per capita income mark. Our banking sector will double. We will see our stock market reaching a new level of around 60 to $70 billion market capitalization. These are all the, the uh, background numbers that will give us the situation in that time. Electrification in our country will probably be 100%. Right now it is about 92%, up sharply from about 72% in the year 2006, so it's on the right side. Poverty will probably decline to about 3%, down sharply from the 15% that we had in 2004-2005. And then in the next five years we will also see a new dimension as far as the country's external account is concerned. We are going to have new inflows particularly foreign capital coming into the country, not just as remittances but also as foreign direct investment which will improve sharply. So the conditions have been set out for that structure and uh, in the next few years we will see that taking place. We see several risks naturally. The world is not in good shape. There are many problems out there which can impact us also. We have uh, taken some of those factors into consideration in our own projections. But nevertheless, sometimes some of these can be very, very severe, the global conditions, like what we have experienced last year and about two or three years ago. But I think when we build up spaces in the economy, our thrust of our economic management has been building spaces so that it gives us room to move. That is what is key. If your inflation is down to 4 or 5 percent, even if it goes up by another 1 percent, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter materially. If your growth is at 8% or more, even if the growth slows down to 7%, you can still live with that. But now some, some countries have growth at 1% or 2%. They don't have space. So that is the difficulty that many of them are facing. Our fiscal deficit has been brought down to about 6.9% now. And if need be, we can increase it a little bit. And still we won't be in a difficult situation. But not that we have to, we won't. But all these parameters show that we are now built up spaces within our economy for us to move. And that is what is key in management of any economy. You 
see, country must have a growth plan. If you just allow a country to drift without any specific area of operations being signaled as those areas that will be the ones that will go forward, you will not find focus. That is why in the Mahindra Chintana vision for the future, you would have seen five specific hubs being mentioned. The aviation hub, which talks about the support that has to come to the economy from the uh, airports, the aviation. Then the marine hub, which is the ports. You can see ports developed in all parts of the uh, coastal areas. Not only the mega ports, there are five mega ports being done, Hambantota, Colombo, Gaul, Kankasanthore and Uruvi. But in addition to that, many fisheries harbors are also being constructed and uh, renovated and uh, rehabilitated. In addition to that, we will have the commercial hub, which means the banking, the insurance, the, uh, uh, the arbitrations, legal, all those are areas where we can have tremendous amount of economic activity taking place. Then of course the knowledge hub, which is the knowledge-based industries. There are many knowledge-based uh, sectors today in the world. The IPOs, uh, sorry, the, the BPOs, then the, uh, uh, then the uh, uh, provision of IT to various companies all over the world. These are all definitely new trends that we will be having. And the knowledge economy will also, knowledge hub will also take into consideration English knowledge, IT knowledge, IT literacy knowledge, all that will be part and parcel of the knowledge hub. Then of course the energy. We are now also moving into a new era where we are exploring for oil. For a long time Sri Lanka was only talking about these things. But now we have finally reached the stage we are actively looking at these factors. So of course in addition to that we are setting up several coal power plants. Uh, so that Sri Lanka will never have a power shortage. You all are, of course, uh, too young to remember the real uh, power shortage that we had in our country. Seven, eight hours, ten hours. Uh, you all would have been small, of course, that time. But still, we suffered through that. Industry suffered through that. Many people were reluctant to come in and invest. But today we have made that a thing of the past. It is also going to be around for the future. And that is what is important, so that there is never a power shortage. So, we are developing the country around these five hubs concept, so that every area of the country's development will have some focus. Of course, there are other industries that we will be uh, also supporting, like the tourism industry and those industries that are already existing, like the plantations, the uh, agriculture and all that was as well. But these are the new areas that we are supporting and the government is taking the necessary lead in that. Central bank provides the stability. That is the most important factor. No one will invest in a country, no one will want to come and do business in a country unless there is underlying stability. So the stability is provided by our macro fundamentals being denied so that things are not fluctuating too much so that there is overall comfort provided to the business people who are doing business. If you have an interest rate which is fluctuating widely or if you have an exchange rate which is fluctuating widely or if you have a financial system where banks are crashing or companies are having difficulties, people have less confidence. So the confidence is the major factor in economic uh, development. So that is provided by the central bank and we watch every single aspect of the economic activity and make interventions wherever necessary to see that those are in line with what we want to stay stable. It's like this, tourism at the moment uh, provides about 1.4% of our GDP. In the next few years, we think that tourism will be about a two and a half billion dollar industry, which will be quite a significant portion of our uh, country's uh, foreign exchange earnings as well as GDP contribution. I remember about five or six years ago, I spoke about two and a half million tourists coming to Sri Lanka. Many people laughed at it. They thought that these were all dreams, but not anymore. So people are now beginning to see the reality of that situation. 
tourism will improve, but there will be a time when it will take a very significant position. But right now, they are also developing quite significantly. Financial scandals can take place at any time, not only in Sri Lanka, all over the world you get financial scandals. It's like you can have the best of laws, but still there will be murders. You can have the best of traffic, but you will still have people who offend. Eh? So in the same way, there will be people who will attempt to do various scandals. Now, our role is to see that we have the laws in place, and we also must have good supervision to see that the institutions that are regulated by the central bank are acting in the proper way. So that has happened to a great extent and we have brought in a fair amount of uh, stern supervision uh, which has enabled this financial system to stay stable. The reason why it has stayed stable in the last five to six years is because of close supervision, uh, implementation of uh, good policies and I think uh, we will continue to do that. There are several ways that you can look at an investment. It depends on the person who is making the investment also. Some people are concerned only about stability. So if you are only concerned about the stability and the safety, you will go for certain types of instruments. If you have an appetite for greater risk, you will go to some other types of instruments. If you have an appetite really for gambling, you may go and put money in a horse and then hope that you will get a huge return afterwards. So different people will have different appetites. So after you have considered what type of appetite you get, and if you take people who generally want to have safety, who also want to have a reasonable return, then you must look at institutions that will provide you with some supervision as well. So that now Central Bank has given certain uh, institutions as being those that are being supervised by them. So those have a much greater chance of being uh, properly run uh, with, with clear supervision than some, some another type of business. So that's why we have to encourage people by saying what the companies are to invest in those companies because then you are a lot safer. And there is also this deposit insurance that we have brought in uh, which gives a certain level of uh, investments the comfort of being supported by the central bank if it fails. So these instruments help you to decide on the risk appetite that you have and then make your investments. So my advice is, depending on your appetite, look at instruments that will give you some safety, also a reasonable degree of return and then make those investments. I think we have already done that. Both India and China have been uh, major investors in Sri Lanka. If you look at the uh, number of industries and uh, investments that China has made, you will find that there are quite a number. From airports to ports to powerhouses, power plants have been invested by China. India has also made very serious investments, particularly in the field of um, uh, cement, banking and uh, in um, they are going to do a massive investment in coal power, they have invested in the railways, all that is also taking place. So we have I think to a great extent uh, made use of those, uh, those um, powerhouse base of those two countries. What have you done? We have a free trade agreement uh, which has worked quite well. And as a result, of course, the imports from India has uh, soared. Exports to India has also been quite substantial. So that is taking place. But with China, <coughs> more than the uh, trade, it has been mainly the investment that has been uh, encouraged. Because China has <coughs> few opportunities for Sri Lanka to make exports. But certainly China has the cash today. China is the is a global player that has sufficient uh, money and they make investments all over the world and that is taking place. Of course that risk is there, that is part and parcel of business risk. 
So local producers also need to improve their productivity, which they have done. And we have seen uh, on many occasions where it has improved quite substantially. If you remember some time ago, uh, there were suggestions that the whole world will collapse if the GSP plus was removed. But nothing happened. That is because the local producers were encouraged to look at their own productivity levels. They enhanced their productivity levels and uh, we have survived. And we have done well. So I think that is a good lesson for us to move forward and for the local industries to take uh, the uh, courage to move forward uh, in a com very competitive environment. EPF is one of, is the biggest fund in our country, and uh, in times in the future, we will probably see with Sri Lanka's economic movement that interest rates will be coming down in the, in the future. So, in that scenario, you will need to have investments that have been made, which will yield you good results. So, EPF has taken a fairly uh, clear call that some of the very good investments in this country should be made by the Sri Lankan money as well. So that will provide the space in the future for these gains to be realized by Sri Lankan funds. Earlier it was only the foreign funds that were making these gains. And there is a great necessity that we also gain by this massive peace dividend that the country has gone through. So the people of this country are the ones who contributed towards the peace dividend. And uh, I think this will ensure that the peace dividend is realized by the people who have invested in the EPF as well. So that will be the long-term decision. It's uh, been done carefully to see that there is a long-term benefit and a value being created within the EPF's investments. And I'm confident that in time to come that will be realized. Absolutely not. Because insider trading suggests that there must be somebody who is going to benefit by it. Those who are working in the EPF are not investing their money. They are investing the money on behalf of the people of the uh, uh, country. Now, the biggest insider trading in that case could be when you invest in the government bonds. Because the monetary board is a board which has the ability to raise interest rates or reduce interest rates. And then, when you have the fund under the monetary board, we have developed certain clear compartments which will ensure that the funds are managed by two different sets of people. So we are confident that that uh, will arise and if you look at the track record, you find that there has been huge returns made by the EPA. And uh, unlike in many other funds that have been managed by the private sector individuals and private sector firms, there have been absolutely no uh, instances of these money is being siphoned off and all these complications. If you take most of the other funds, there have been allegations of that sort. And here, if you look at the uh, rates at which returns have been provided to the EPF also, those have been all much above the market rates that have been provided by the banks. And in fact, last year, the average rate that was given on fixed deposits by the banks were about um, 9, 10 percent. But the EPF paid 12 and a half percent. That is because of the sound investment that they have made, which enable them to give this return. And EPF as a long-term fund is also concerned about providing a return well over the inflation rate. So that is another yardstick by which long-term funds are measured. So in all those areas also, the EPF has been coming out strong. See, the central bank's main role is providing financial system stability and economic and price stability. Without stability, you cannot really have any economic function taking place. Now, in that sense, central bank has many tools. We have uh, interest rate tool, we have open market operations, we can give directions to banks, we can uh, provide liquidity to the banks, we can intervene in uh, instances where banks have to be given uh, uh, some additional support or given directions to behave themselves. All those are tools that the central bank possesses. So in that sense, the, our role is fairly clearly set out in the Act, in the Montreal Act, 
and uh, we have uh, delivered stability. So even in the future, the roles of the central bank will be to support the ongoing economic activity while ensuring that we stay stable. The, the central bank of Sri Lanka also has a role where we are the economic advisor to the government. So we provide uh, policy advice at various times, quite regularly. There are some statutory advices also that we provide. But by and large, our function is that. And the governor's role is to be the chief executive officer of the central bank. And in that sense, there is a fairly wide scope uh, to ensure that the work is carried down in such a way that uh, the objectives of the central bank are met. And uh, that uh, overall role uh, does not change. It will continue, although in, in different times, different activities will be undertaken. I think it's uh, fairly well laid out in our plans where we have set out what we call our uh, roadmap and also in our annual report in the direction. We also give policy advice to the government as I said. And I think <coughs> in the next few years our main function would be to ensure that growth takes place while we provide stability. Sometimes it is very easy to uh, make things stable in a very sterile environment. You can say, I have uh, provided stability if you can stop all the activities. There was a time when uh, unemployment was high, but still the government did not contribute too much to enhancing employment. They cut down on investment. They pruned the budget down very drastically. In a scenario of that nature, it's quite easy to maintain stability because you can say, okay, everything is quiet. But in a time when there is movement, when there is growth, when there is huge amount of economic activity, then maintaining stability is a challenge. So we will see that as our challenge because we are keen to, as a country, to move on a high growth path, 8% plus growth in the next few years. And when you go on a journey of that nature, particularly when the world conditions are fairly tight and tough, uh, we will have our challenges cut out for us in relation to stability. But that's part and parcel of the whole exercise. We are confident that we can deal with that. There has been a lot of um, activities in the Northern East which if anyone who goes there can see very clearly. I have been there 13 times myself since the end of the war and uh, opened many, many branches and uh, spurred economic development in those areas. And we are quite satisfied that all those uh, efforts have worked to a great extent. Investment has been done on a mega scale across roads, hospitals, uh, power plants, power provision, then uh, fisheries harbours, uh, the uh, school buildings. There's a massive amount of investment that has been made. But in addition to that, livelihood development has also been done. Where about 60,000 new loans were given in the north alone. About another 50,000 new loans were given in the east. All of which may be close to 10 billion rupees. But all of which help to create livelihood. That is what is important. When people were resettled after the war, they had to be looking out for jobs but, or some livelihood activity. So what do they do? So cultivation, fisheries, small industries. <coughs> I've met many uh, undergraduates who may have been LTTAs in the past. And one person told me that he's going to set up internet kiosk. I was very uh, pleased to hear that. So he was taking a loan, buying the computers and setting up an internet kiosk. So if we did not provide those loans and did not provide the enabling environment, he would have probably not had much to do. So like that, there are many, many, many examples where people have been provided with the scope to undertake activities. So that is the key success in the North. If you go to the North, have you been to the North? You must go and see. Then only you will realize what a huge transformation has taken place. These were dead cities immediately after the war. Now, you can see that they are bustling with life. Motorcycles, cars, buses, people, all that is happening. All that has happened because of the activity that has been provided. So we are uh, on the right track, but 
plenty more to be done because they, it's still a lagging region, still a lagging province. And unless the investment takes place from the private sector also, these will continue to be slow. But uh, over the next few years, we are seeing a fairly clear investment path also. So when that happens, these will improve. So they have done that in the EU and you can see the difficulties that they are having. No? Now, of course, the common currency is a movement that you go to once several other factors are also in place. The currency alone <coughs> can't, can't stand alone. You have to have several other factors that uh, are connected to it. <coughs> now, if you take Sri Lanka, we have a currency and at the same time we have a control over our fiscal policy, we have control over our monetary policy, we have control over our debt, we have control over the other uh, incentives that we can provide within the, uh, within the, the, the economy. Now, unless you have control over those aspects of the economic activity, it is very dangerous to have a common currency because sometimes the amount of currency, the uh, projected perception outside could all be different uh, and then you can have serious problems. So that is why those preconditions should also be met if you want to really move towards the uh, congruence of currency. See, over the next few years, as has happened in the past, many companies are seeking rounded individuals, not just only people who have a single focus. Companies, corporates like to have people who have a broader knowledge and a broader understanding and sometimes being able to undertake multitasking as well. So having different skills, particularly the supporting skills like IT, helps a great deal. IT can be a standalone skill for a software program, but IT can be a huge advantage to an engineer, to an architect, to, an, uh, to a doctor. So you have to understand that these are skills and traits that people should have anyway. So in that sense, uh, combining these skills is definitely uh, something that we will support. See, if you want to develop Sri Lanka to be the wonder of Asia, the Sri Lankans have to do that, not anybody else. So it is vital that we take it upon ourselves to deliver. We cannot allow or wait for the Americans to come or the Russians to come or the Chinese to come or somebody else to come. Every country that developed, developed with their own efforts. So we got to understand that and if that is the case, Two or three people or the government alone cannot do that. Everyone has to give in their support and work hard towards it. If these things don't come easy. It doesn't come automatically also. People have to provide and then only they will be able to gain the results. You all have heard the story about the Andi Hattenage Kadahari. If you put air, you will get air. If you work, then you will get work back. And that is what is important. So productivity is important. Having a work ethic is important. If you take the central bank, our staff here, at any time of the day or night, they will work. And it's because of the passion. They are all government servants, actually, if you see. But they continue to do that. If you take our soldiers, they didn't look at the clock and they didn't fight. They didn't say, now it's five o'clock and then now it's time for me to go and have tea. They fought. So there were many occasions like that when Sri Lankans rose to the occasion and then performed. Our 8% growth also didn't come free, it didn't come automatically or accidentally. Because many people worked hard at it that it happened. So we want to continue that for some more time, 5-6 years if you want to be a wonder of Asia. So we can. So we have to work hard towards that and I think uh, people have to have that courage and the feeling of that we can do in order to do that.